pain medicine fellowship department. Uh, this was initially intended to be just purely a grand rounds and a sort of a closed discussion, but uh, because of the open mindedness of our leadership, we we're able to invite some more people and have this be more interactive. So welcome everyone. Uh, everyone's loving the clapping feature. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, so we can go ahead and, and, and get started. Mo, if you want to take the lead. Sure, I'm just setting myself up here. So if everyone wants to walk over a little bit, James, you can walk us through a little bit of the objectives for today. Okay. And then yeah. um, I'll go ahead and introduce our topic. All right, so if, if everybody will kind of come look over to your right, come in front of this big slide that says objectives, what, what we're going to do, the way this is set up is we're going to have different talking points, and we can kind of gather around the talking points and, and progress throughout the stage. Now, you will notice that if you guys point and click on the, on the slide decks here that they will actually advance. I, I, just, I ask that while we're talking about it that you uh, not click on it so that, uh, so that we can advance and, and talk about it, basically. All right, so... Today's lecture is called Intro to Orthobiologics, a.k.a. Regenerative Medicine. So we have a couple objectives to define. Essentially, number one, most important, what is orthobiologics and what is all the terminology? Because there's a lot of terminology out there. Number two, we're going to talk about the physiology and the anatomy of the things that you can treat with orthobiologics, specifically the target tissues and how they heal and what we do to promote their healing. Number three, we're going to discuss the different components of treatment. We have a certain amount of uh, tools in our artillery or in our toolbox, and we can use them in very specific and very useful ways. Um, next, we're going to talk about, you know, we'll briefly touch on the data supporting each. I will say that as I'm teaching you guys about, you know, orthobiologics, I'm also learning a lot about this myself, and I'm very new to it, and there's a lot of data, and there's a lot of... Um, I want to say debate and controversy that I am by no means an expert in just yet. Hopefully in a year and a half time I will be, but um, if you guys have questions, save the questions for the end. We do have some experts among us that might be able to chime in and help us. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about something that's super important in the realm of orthobiologics, and that is FDA regulation because, you know, this is all... Uh, in, this, is all, this is a developing field. There's a lot of experimental aspects to this, and the FDA, you know, they have to do their due diligence in making sure that there isn't quackery afoot. Pardon the, uh, the, the puppies. They're having, a, they're having a blast. All right. So if you guys will follow me over to the right, to the next slide here, we will just kind of briefly discuss, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about. Uh, Mo, I can help you... Um, I can help you advance through these slides if you like. Awesome. Yeah, so we're, we're going to give a – this is a, a, an entire discipline in itself that, you know, we're at down to 49 minutes uh, of covering an entire discipline we'll go on to study for years. And so what we're going to do is try to give a broad overview. We're going to get into the nitty-gritty just, just a little bit. Um, and I know we have a diverse background of, in, in the audience, some in medicine and some that aren't. Um, so just to, to define what, intro, uh, what orthobiologics are, they're basically natural substances within our bodies that can be introduced into orthopedic tissues like bone, cartilage, tendons, ligaments, muscles, and the discs with the goal of uh, healing them. Uh, these substances can either be directly injected into the damaged tissue which is what most of our focus will be on today. But they can also be introduced uh, intraoperatively during surgery to help augment the healing process after surgery. And as Dr. Gaddis mentioned, you know, there is comedy and um, sort of legal implications uh, revolving this, this general field. And so what we'll cover is, about, is going to be about 95% of what's out there. And it's not to say that what's illegal is necessarily bad. I mean, some of what's illegal in the United States is still practiced in other in other countries. You know, with regulations and the FDA, we uh, have to abide by those. 
And so you can basically break down orthobiologics into two main categories. Where do they come from and the type of tissue? So where do they come from? There's uh, autologous and there's allogeneic. And autologous is simply Simply your own tissues used to heal your own body. And allogeneic is someone else's tissues used to treat you. Uh, so for the autologous types, take your own blood and we can make it into PRP, platelet, platelet rich plasma, which Dr. Gaddis will get into in a lot more detail in just a bit. Um, and we can release growth factors from there that have implications for healing. Uh, there's platelet lysates, which are your own growth factors uh, just in the serum, and there's the core plasma and cytokine and roots. Um, when it comes to bone marrow, we can uh, extract bone marrow and take the stem cells and concentrate them, and that would be bone marrow concentrate. And from fat, you can take fat and uh, you know chop it up into really fine pieces and extract the stem cells, and that's called uh, microfragmented fat. And um, there's the stromal vascular fraction, SVF, from fat, which is essentially extracting uh, the stem cell components of fat. Um, but that's, that, it, that part of it is illegal in the United States as it, as it stands right now. Uh, when it comes to the allogeneic types, there, um, there, it was always sort of understood that there were live cells in allogeneic tissue, allogeneic tissue uh, being first tissue like amniotic fluid and, and the umbilical cord. Um, but all of the more recent research has sort of disproved that. And so there really are no true live cells within, within um, allogeneic, um, allogeneic cells. Um, but in terms of the types, there's amniotic membrane and fluid, and then there's umbilical cord, blood, and orange jelly. And so we can walk over to the next slide deck and we'll sort of lay down the framework a little bit of the, the healing cascade. Why don't we all come on over? Yeah. I'll just give everyone. A quick second. Wow, you guys are quick. I like it. So, in order to really um, understand the the various therapies that are that are implicated here, and that's like the, the meat of all of this, we really do need to understand the healing cascade as it as it pertains to the musculoskeletal system. And next slide, Jim. So we'll just briefly touch. Um, it's your first time hearing about it. Um, but essentially, whenever there's an injury um, there, it, it, to, to, to tissue, and this is going to, I'm speaking broad about all tissues, there's the initial bleeding, and the goal is to stop the bleeding. So what we get there is attrition and the initiation of the coagulation cascade, ultimately to form a clot from collagen, thrombin and fibronectin. And what this clot does is it serves as a scaffold for leukocytes, cytokines, and growth factors to initiate the inflammatory cycle and modulate healing. Um, this results in an increased vascular permeability and, and more blood flow and the migration of cells to, to the affected area, to the injured area. And so this inflammatory response also triggers uh, neutrophil migration through cell signaling which helps manage the cellular debris after the injury. And then subsequently, the monocytes and macrophages clear out these neutrophils and release fibroblasts, uh, and this starts the proliferative phase. So just to be clear, what I talked about was the inflammatory phase. There's the three main phases, the inflammatory phase, the proliferative phase, saturation, and remodel. So all of that was the inflammatory phase. Uh, the proliferative phase is characterized mostly by angiogenesis and fibroplasia, and these are modulated by these phases are modulated by fibroblasts and epithelial cells. Um, angiogenesis occurs as a mechanism of the body to enhance blood flow to the injured area, and then next fibroplasia occurs uh, when the fibroblasts come in and lay down the collagen framework. Uh, 
we then go enter the, the, the next phase of, of healing. Uh, and this is broadly speaking from day eight all the way out to a year or even, even, even longer. Um, and this phase is composed of strengthening the extracellular matrix, um, which forms along the stress lines, um, but never really is as organized as the original tissue was before injury. And therefore it, it's not as strong. And just to be clear, you know, the time frames on these three phases really do depend on a number of factors, including the patient's age, um, their comorbidities, and the injury itself, the extent of the injury itself, and, and the tissue in which it was injured, the tissue which was injured. All right. right. So next, a little bit more, and so what you see there on the screen are the, the three phases um, on a timeline, and there is some overlap, um, but broadly speaking, um, they, they, they occur in, in sort of this, in sort of this fashion. So let's walk over to the orange slide deck here. Uh, we'll dive a little bit deeper into each tissue and, and how this healing cascade happens uh, with some some of the nuances pertaining to each tissue. So come on over. You know, I'm, I'm really impressed with how fast everybody's getting the hang of like moving around. I know, I'm the last one to show up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it took me quite some time to like get the hang of this. So let's dive in a little bit into each of the different tissues. So muscles, tendons, ligaments, cartilage, um, bone, structure and function of these uh, tissues are related to the healing cascade. So we'll start off with muscle. Um, the healing cascade in muscle starts with uh, the initial injury leading to myofibril rupture and capillary damage. And it's really this capillary damage and myofibril rupture that starts the whole process. So what we do, what we have is a as an influx of calcium, and ultimately that clot formation that we talked about, and this leads to inflammatory cells migrating to to the site of injury, activating fibroblasts and a very specific myogenic stem cell uh, called satellite cells that's specific to muscles. And so during the proliferative phase, these satellite cells undergo differentiation into myoblasts, and then during the remodeling phase, these new myoblasts will ultimately differentiate into new muscle fiber. And, and so a, an interesting you know, finding we came across was uh, um, by Teixeira et al. And what he found was that muscle loading increases the number of cells, the amount of proliferation and differentiation. Um, so loading the, loading the muscles. And they even found that electrical stimulation uh, can preserve satellite cell numbers and impaired length. So this is pretty cool because what it's suggesting is that muscles in movement, um, such as after exercise, might be better prepared to respond effectively to a muscle injury. And even an impaired limb that isn't able to exercise, if you deliver electrical stimulation, there's they found preservation of these satellite cells, which is ultimately helping this healing cascade and the healing process of the of the muscle. Um, we'll go, go on to tendons. So tendons, uh, the, inherent, uh, the, the inherent mechanics of tendons really depend on the location of the tendon. Right? So the amount of shear, uh, compression, tension, and torque all influence the remodeling of tendons. Uh, so this leads to a, a sort of a wide disparity in the degree of injury and the extent and time frame of healing. Uh, the process of tendon remodeling involves a, a sort of a, a balance between, between collagen synthesis and degradation. So initially there's collagen degradation, and then that's followed by collagen synthesis. And it's important to note uh, specifically to tendons that uh, matrix metalloproteases play a key role in, in the injury and healing cascade. Um, it's still a little unclear what's happening at a cellular level with these MMPs, um, but we do know that they're highly implicated. And we also, and similarly to muscles, um, exercise influences, influences uh, collagen synthesis, more specifically uh, tendons seem to improve with loading, which activates protein kinases, 
and then ultimately increases uh, type one collagen turnover, promoting the buildup of tendon. Um, when it comes to uh, with uh, significantly decreased tensile load, and their role, their role, they interlink bone, bone to bone. So their role is to provide passive joint stability through normal ranges of motion through the joint. Uh, so traumatic ligament injury can result in either partial or complete tears, um, but ultimately they're going to go through the same three phases uh, of the healing cascade. So. Uh, the inflammatory phase as it pertains to ligaments, there will be retraction of the disrupted segment of the ligament, which will form a gap. And then within this gap, we'll see clot formation and the recruitment of cytokines and the inflammatory mediators. And in the proliferative and fibroblast phase, the disorganized fragments that we just mentioned are composed of mostly less organized collagen. And then in the remodeling phase, the fragments start to organize and the tensile load uh, improves, and the properties of force transmission within the, the ligaments themselves also begin to improve during this last remodeling phase. So the, the, the ligaments that we have after, after healing are never as elastic um, or organized as the original tissue once was prior to injury. Kind of makes you sad to think about that, right? Yeah, you hurt yourself. Right. Like it's never quite the same. It's never going to be quite the same. Okay, so next is cartilage. And the hallmark feature of cartilage uh, that differentiates it from most, of other, most other tissues um, is the near absence of blood supply. So, you know, we talked about in the healing cascade, all of this really starts with bleeding. And bleeding triggers this cascade and cell signaling and the recruitment of all of these um, cells that ultimately takes us through these phases. Is a healing. Um, uh, so, but however, in cartilage, that's not necessarily the case. You can have an injury to your cartilage that can never, that will never heal. Um, now, what that implies clinically, you know, varies. Um, however, if the injury to the cartilage uh, penetrates the subchondral plate, that'll allow more blood to come in and for a more robust healing. So histolog uh, histologically speaking, healed cartilage resembles fibrocartilage rather than hyaline cartilage. So the, fi the final product of healed cartilage is much stiffer th than the original cartilage before it was injured. Again. And finally, with bone, also again, goes through the same three, three uh, major phases. When a fracture occurs, the inflammatory phase begins um, with the bleeding and clot formation the release of cytokines and growth factors, which we're repeating ourselves here, but um, and, and they're responsible for the proliferation of chondroblasts and osteoblasts to fill the fracture site with granulation tissue. So what's first is chondroblasts will form a soft callus, and then these osteoblasts will come in and gradually replace the soft calluses with immature woven bone, and then eventually into hard callus. Um, um, and what's important is that if the bony fragments from a, uh, from a fracture are, are well approximated, the healing is more reliable than, say, tendon and cartilage because of the generous blood supply that's inherent in bone tissue as compared to the others. So really, the, the, the blood supply of the tissue is really going to dictate how well um, uh, the healing process can occur. And later on, there's, there's a pretty good example uh, that illustrates how we can use orthobiologics to um, to optimize this, you know, inherent healing properties. And let's say a bone that doesn't heal for whatever reason. Um, thank you, Mo. All right, if you guys want to follow me over to kind of the middle part of the stage here, if you want to the next part here, we'll kind of move on to the portion of the talk. If I could ask you guys just to be careful not to advance the slides. Um, it just kind of helps me keep my train of thought. So we talked about all these inherent properties of healing, all the different tissues. How do we harness um, our own tissue to optimize our own healing? Well, we have these three main components, prolotherapy, platelet-rich plasma, and then mesenchymal stromal cells, or aka 
adult stem cells, which I don't like the word. We'll, we'll talk about that. Stem cell is kind of a misnomer, we'll, we'll, but we'll talk about that. So if you want to direct your attention over to this slide here where it says prolotherapy, this is probably the first. This is the original um, uh, orthobiologic that we had. So what is prolotherapy? Prolotherapy is just it's a sugar water solution. It's hypertonic dextrose. And what it does is that because of the basic principles of osmosis, um, by injecting hypertonic dextrose into a tissue, it kind of jump starts the healing cascade by recruiting um, fluids, basically. It recruits water, and with it comes you know, all the growth factors and the nutrients that come along with a water influx. So hypertonic dextrose, it jump starts the healing cascade, it triggers scarring down and collagen formation and improves the tensile strength of ligaments. Um, we use this specifically for joints that have ligamentous laxity. Uh, you know, we kind of mentioned earlier that ligaments have this crimped collagen that gives it that very, like, a high tensile strength, but it can kind of creep or just unfurl over time, be, you know, after, like, prolonged, sustained tension on a ligament. So by using hypertonic dextrose, you can kind of cause that to shrink back up again using, using almost like a scarring mechanism. Um, there's a milieu of studies out there talking about prolotherapy, um, and, you know, the results of these studies are kind of variable on, like, the design of the study, the technical protocols, the proficiency of the physician, and so on. So there's a lot of variability in the data. Um, so real briefly, I'm, I'm just going to kind of run over some seminal papers uh, on, on prolotherapy. So here... You know, there was a study by Jangahari and others that compared prolotherapy to steroids, which we commonly use, and uh, osteoarthritis of the hand. And those patients tended to have better, uh, they, they, uh, they reported better ease of movement in their hand and, and function with their hand. And they did that by, te you know, testing uh, like uh, um, supination and pronation and, and, and like twisting of these like different tools, almost like an occupational therapy type exercise. They also compared prolotherapy versus lidocaine and patients reported improved pain compared to lidocaine injections even at six months post-treatment. We all here have done trigger point injections with lidocaine. That stuff lasts like 24 hours. Um, let's see here. There was a study done by uh, Centennial and others out in Colorado using fluoroscopically guided prolotherapy injections into the posterior elements of the cervical spine. By posterior elements, we mean the interspinous ligaments, the supraspinous ligament, um, the facet joints, um, the, trans, uh, the, the, the ligaments in between the transverse processes. This is great for patients who have been in whiplash. And as Dr. Brimhall demonstrated to us a few weeks ago, Whiplash is a, an orchestra of horrible forces on the neck that just really disrupt ligaments and it disrupts the proprioception of ligaments. So by using um, prolotherapy and inject them uh, in, into the ligaments that have been deemed unstable, we can get into that later how they deem that. It's a, it's a technical kind of radiographic study. Um, they found that patients reported uh, improved pain scores. They found decreased dizziness uh, and they felt on post-injection studies that there was less instability and less laxity in those ligaments. And um, for those of you who are neurology trained like myself, you know, you worry about how, how, how high you're injecting in the cervical spine. As you can see in this graph, um, this graph here, they injected from C2 all the way down to C6, C7. Um, there was also so studies that looked at the sacroiliac joints uh, injecting, uh, interesting, interestingly enough, excuse me, this study was injecting prolotherapy into the joint, and traditionally we would inject prolotherapy into the ligaments around the joint, but despite that, uh, they, were, they still demonstrated superiority, supposedly, versus uh, steroid injections. Here's a host of other studies that have been conducted. Um, you know, they studied using uh, prolotherapy and people with failed back syndrome. For those of you who don't know, failed back syndrome is, is a syndrome that someone experiences after they have had back surgery, whether it was the removal of bone, 
fusion, removal of disk, you know, placement of hardware, things like that. Um, so they injected a number of targets. They injected the sacroiliac ligaments, iliolumbar ligaments, all the, you know, all these, you know, intersegmental ligaments. And they also injected kind of that, that pelvic ring, pubofemoral ligament, piriformis, uh, insertion and origin, the insertion and origin of the iliofemoral ligaments, and so on. And they found that this, they had better outcomes than someone who w underwent re-operation. Um, let's see, let's just, for the sake of time, we'll kind of move on. So that, that's that for, for prolotherapy. So prolotherapy, we use it to try to strengthen ligaments and treat ligamentous laxity because a joint that has lax ligaments is a joint that's predisposed to arthritis, and as we all know, an arthritic joint is quite painful. All right, so we can direct our attention to our next tool. This is probably your most effective, or I would say this, it's your low-hanging fruit. Platelet-rich plasma is the tool that we all have. It's very easy to get. It's very easy to process. There's multiple variations of platelet-rich plasma that you can use in a multitude of symptoms. Uh, um, let's see. Can you guys see the slide, or does it look blank for all of you? Okay. Well, here we go. So, you know, I think the slides that are turning up blank, I think I'm discussing what is platelet-rich plasma. So platelet-rich plasma is basically, it's a blood draw where we take your, you know, venous blood, you centrifuge it, and you separate the red blood cells from the plasma, which is like the serum that contains white blood cells, platelets, growth factors, all the fun stuff in your blood outside of just the red blood cells themselves. And from there, you can modify that platelet-rich plasma or that serum in a number of different ways to optimize your treatment. Now, in general, there are two main types of uh, platelet-rich plasma. If you look at this picture here, you'll notice on the right-hand side, there's some serum here that looks kind of uh, golden and amber. This is called leukocyte-poor PRP, meaning that what they do is once they spin down the blood, they actually take out what's called the buffy coat, which is this dense layer of all the white blood cells, all the inflammatory cells, and you get this kind of golden amber looking PRP that is just platelets and serum devoid of any red blood cells and devoid of any white blood cells. On the left, you'll see this kind of bloody looking serum, and that's called leukocyte rich plasma. And what you're doing is, you know, after you spin it down, you're actually, you, you, you do take some red blood cells with you, but you also take all of the white blood cells that are included in that serum. And I'll talk about why this distinction matters. Okay, so, so I think it kind of skipped the slide for me. I don't know why. All right, that's fine. No big deal. Um, so leukocyte poor plasma, this golden amber stuff, is nice. It, it seems to be more effective for treating problems within a joint, intraarticular injections like knee arthritis um, or hip arthritis. By injecting it into the joint, we find that not having the white blood cells in there is less caustic to the joint. It causes less of an in, in, inflammatory flare-up. They've also found in a number of different studies that white blood cells are actually toxic to the synoviocytes, the, the cells that kind of line the joint capsule that produce synovial or joint fluid. Um, on the other hand, leukocyte rich plasma, this red stuff here, for some reason it seems to be a lot more effective in treating tendino tendinopathies and ligamentous tears. Something about those white blood cells being there and, and recruiting that kind of robust inflammatory response while those tissues are under some sort of tensile strength seems to have a, a, a better response. Now, outside of leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor, you have, um, and it's not listed here, I think it got skipped for some reason, but you have something called super concentrated plasma, and basically that is where you, you know, you spin down the blood, you get rid of the red blood cells, you get rid of the white blood cells, and you're left with, you know, your physiologic concentration of platelets, and then you spin down, that down even more, and even more, and even more, and basically you have this super dense pellet of a bunch of platelets, and within those platelets are all the good stuff, all the good growth factors, the cytokines and the interleukins and all these things. 
um, when you make a super concentrated platelet um, uh, platelet rich plasma, the supernatant or the runoff that you get from all those spinoffs are is called platelet poor plasma. Now, now the rationale behind all this is that the more concentrated uh, a platelet solution you have, the more growth factors you have, and the more robust inflammatory response and healing response you get. The platelet poor plasma, you know, traditionally people kind of just toss it out there like it's it's worth plus whatever, but they found that it is it's still really, really rich in alpha-2 macroglobulins, and macroglobulins are important because they're kind of like, uh, it's like, a, uh, almost like a Swiffer, in that it catches and, and binds up these like proteases that cause a lot of tissue degradation. So platelet-poor plasma, we kind of use it as a glue for like wound healing. Like let's say you do an injection or you have a small incision, you know, you can inject some platelet-poor plasma into that incision and it helps it heal faster. The next thing I want to talk about, which is I think is really cool, is called platelet lysate. Platelet lysate is basically PRP, but you, you freeze it to lyse the platelets, break them open. It spills out all their goodies, all those growth factors. And then you pass it through a filter to get rid of all the clotting type uh, uh, components, anything like all the platelet aggregates that can cause some sort of clot. And that's important because a lot of times we want to inject these things into areas where you don't want to clot. Namely, the epidural space. If you, get, you know, if you inject into the epidural space and you cause a, you know, a blood vessel occlusion, you could cause a, a very serious spinal cord stroke or spinal cord infarct. So, by using platelet lysate, you can actually access more delicate areas, more sacred areas. Um, it's actually been shown to be very effective in lumbar radiculopathy. People have had ongoing improvement uh, of their radicular pain, sciatica type pain, for up to two years. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so quickly we can talk about the timeline of PRP therapy. So it's not really straightforward. There's kind of an ebb and flow. There's a two-step forward, one-step back kind of characteristic to this. You know, I actually just had PRP injections done on my shoulder last week, and I will tell you what, man, those first two days, I was, I was definitely feeling it. It felt like I injured my shoulder. Um, that is that inflammatory response. It kickstarted that inflammatory response. Over the course of several weeks, you actually have a precipitous drop-off in the pain and you start to feel improvement. And from like weeks two to eight, you feel almost like, almost like you never had anything done. You feel like you felt the way you did before you had the injection. After that is when you start to notice this rapid healing and you're, you start to feel improvement in pain. And so as, as we've illustrated here, you know, you have um, good days. You know, you see this little... Um, let me just get a little bit closer here. You'll see that there's, you know, between no improvement and 100% improvement, you get your injection. Some days are good, some days are bad. But overall, you have a, a net positive until you start feeling a lot better. Um, and in general, it takes about 8 to 12 weeks. Okay. Uh, um, I can touch briefly on some of the studies here, but uh, let's see what time it is. For the sake of time, I'm going to kind of move fast through this. So we know that PRP, there's a, uh, two systematic reviews that show that PRP is, is effective, essentially. Um, there's kind of a, a paucity of like head-to-head -head trials, but they're, they're out there. Um, there's a study by Centeno and others on Colorado treating lumbar radiculopathy with platelet lysate, and these people had pretty significant, 72% of the, of the uh, study arm had in, improved pain significantly less pain for, I think it was up to two years. I didn't write it here, but I'm pretty sure it was up to two years. All right, uh, just a couple more studies here about, you know, platelet concentrate and treating common things that we see like tennis elbow, golf elbow. Um, and, and of course, you guys are free to come visit the stage again and, and, and kind of flip through these studies. Um, here's another I, study I can, that I looked at. quickly summarize. Oh yeah, I can Thank quickly you. summarize this on here, James. Yeah, so this first study that you see here, uh, really what we're looking at is like, what you know, what does the literature suggest about PRP and its evidence? So I'm going to highlight a couple of the of the larger scale studies that are often cited. So in this study by Pierre Boone in 2010, they compared leukocyte rich PRP versus corticosteroid injection, which was the, you know the mainstay management at the time for lateral epicondylitis. And with leukocyte-rich PRP, we found significantly reduced uh, BAS and DAS scores 
and successful response without repeat injections. We're really not going to dive too deep into here. We just want to highlight that there are studies out there that are showing um, some promising results. Um, the next study, uh, we see this kind of repeated here with the other study for uh, chronic lateral epicondylitis in terms of improvement of pain scores and residual uh, elbow tenderness. And then moving on, uh, there's a study, there's five lines of treatment for patellar tendinopathy and knee, and this is a double-blind randomized control style, uh, trial. And so that Dragu et al. in 2014, he reported significant improvements in patellar tendinopathy with ultrasound-guided leukocyte-rich PRP at 12 weeks, but the, these results weren't sustained at 26 weeks as compared to dry needle and alone. So, you know, we're, with this condition, platellar tendinopathy, if we can maintain the efficacy long-term um, uh, with long-term follow-up as, as we've seen with, uh, say, tennis elbow. Uh, uh, the next, uh, I'll just the last one that, you know, does intraarticular platelet-rich plasma injection provide clinically superior outcomes compared with other therapies in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis um, and then here we're looking at a systematic review of PRP for knee osteoarthritis, and it showed leukocyte poor formulations having potential for symptomatic relief for up to 12 months, uh, particularly in patients with lower grades of knee osteoarthritis, so mild to moderate. And and we see that theme um, along, you know, when you when you really dive into the literature, you'll see that theme um, of earlier grade disease having better response as opposed to those, um, you know, severe, uh, severe osteoarthritic knees uh, and other joints. I'm and just going to... For the interest of time, we'll, we'll stop there in terms of... Yep. Yeah. All right, so if you guys want to follow me over to this green slide here, we'll move to the, uh, the holy grail of orthobiologics, and these are called mesenchymal stromal cells colloquially known as adult stem cells, but as we've come to find out that using the word stem cell is probably not the best idea. Um, it is confusing because in reality there's no actual, there's very few if no stem cells by definition in this. There are uh, stromal supportive, you know, uh, tissue cells or nucleated cells in this therapy, but they're not by definition stem cells. So, so that's an important distinguishment. Let's go next here. Okay, so what is a mesenchymal stromal cell? So basically this term was coined in the 90s. Uh, oh, what just happened there? You guys able to see this slide okay? All right, so mesenchymal stromal cell was a term that was coined in the 90s. In 2006, the International Society for Cellular Therapy gave it six criteria, basically. Um, I believe I only have a few of them listed here. But basically, it must adhere to plant in a culture condition. It must express certain cell differentiation markers and lack other specific cell di differentiation markers. Um, it must be able to differentiate into osteoblasts, which are bone precursor cells, chondroblasts, which are cartilage precursor cells, and adipocytes, which is fat cells. Uh, then again, we have another definition here defined by the NIH. Stem cells differ from other kinds of cells in the body because stem cells have three general properties. They are capable of dividing and renewing themselves for long periods, and they are unspecialized, meaning that they can give rise to any sort of cell type in the body. That is different than mesenchymal stromal cells because stromal cells, think of it as like a cell with mm, a bachelor's degree, and it pretty much knows what it, what it wants to do. It can get its masters and become a bone. It can get another masters and become cartilage, but it's not going to go back to high school and decide to become a neuron, you know. So stem cells are like high school students. Um, stem cells are, and, and we'll talk about this later, stem cells are not met by the FDA's requirements for what's called a minimally manipulated therapy, and we'll talk about that soon. Um, so anything that, you know, so it's stem cells which involves concentration of stem cells, expansion, enzymatic digestion, all these things require uh, what's called a 351 under the FDA, which is basically a new drug. So like 
that requires millions of dollars, billions of dollars, really, several years. And these are usually things that are done by pharmaceuticals. If I'm not mistaken, my bone marrow is not sponsored by a pharmaceutical, so it is very difficult to get these types of therapeutics approved under the 351 in the U.S. So they're commonly done outside of the U.S. Okay, um, so again, just kind of furthering this point, are they stem cells? When we do, like, let's say, like a bone marrow aspiration or a, or, or a fat graft aspiration, what you're really getting the majority of times is you're getting um, what's called myelopoietic or erythropoietic cells. These are cells that are kind of dedicated to becoming some sort of connective tissue. And in, in reality, you have like one in a million cells is a stem cell. So you're really not injecting stem cells. Now, you can concentrate this and culture expand them and whatnot, but that falls under that kind of FDA regulation that you can't do in the United States currently. We're fighting the good fight. All right. Um, I put this up here because everybody always asks, like, oh, if you inject your stem cells, are you going to get cancer? Um, there are two huge studies done by Hernigo and others and Centeno and others that showed that at, by Hernigo at 12 and a half years that there was no, uh, peop, you know, 1,800 people who had gotten autologous bone marrow injections had no increased risk of cancer at the injection site or anywhere else in their body. Centeno, you know, did a retrospective study with 23, or excuse me, 3,000 injections in 2,300 patients for two and a half years and only had, out of that many people, only seven people reported cancer, which is actually lower than the general incidence. Okay, um, so the general approach to treating with mesenchymal stem cells is um, a construction site analogy. I think maybe I skipped over this earlier, but think of treating with orthobiologics as, as having a construction site. Um, and you have certain characters in the construction site, and you have certain tools. So PRP and prolotherapy, those are your building materials. That's your lumber, that's your concrete, that's your rebars, all that good stuff. The mesenchymal stromal cells are your contractors and your construction workers. They are the ones who are recruiting all these tools and building them and telling people what to do. Um, so they're, think of them as like the general contractors. So they, they work well, they work in harmony. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to have them in combination, but it, it's definitely optimal. Okay. If you go on Google and you type in, you know, adult cell-based therapies or stem cell therapy, you're going you're gonna to be bombarded with all kinds of terms. So what is what? You've got BMAC, you've got adipose stromal vascular fraction, you've got fat graft, Wharton's jelly, which sounds like something from Krispy Kreme, uh, amniotic stem cells, and umbilical cord blood. So how do you make sense of all this? So there are two major classifications. Dr. Omar kind of touched on this earlier in, in our intro. You have autologous and allogeneic. Autologous meaning it comes from the patient themselves and it's being injected back into them. Um, and primarily you derive this from the bone marrow and from or from adipose tissue. There were some studies that looked at, you know, extracting it from synovial tissue, but it really wasn't effective. It was kind of like low yields. Um, autologous tissues, your own tissue, is subject to that minimally manipulated and homologous use clause clauses in the FDA, which means that if you take somebody's tissue, you have to use that tissue for what that tissue's inherent properties are intended for. Like if I take your bone marrow and I inject it into your um, spinal canal to tell you that I'm going to cure your MS, that's not homologous use because that tissue is not going to turn into neurons. Similarly, I can't manipulate that tissue beyond a certain degree. And if a tissue stays outside of the body for more than 24 hours, it's considered not minimally manipulated anymore. And that pretty much anything that you could do to these tissues to make them worthwhile, not excuse me, not worthwhile, but <clears throat> considered stem cells or concentrated stem cells takes more than 24 hours. And so by definition, this can't be done in the United States. Um, allogeneic is tissue that comes from a donor. We see allogeneic tissue everywhere. I mean, out of my co-fellows here, you know, we've all done SIG joint fusions and we use that kind of bone matrix or that demineralized bone matrix, that is considered an allograft, an allogeneic tissue. That little dowel that we implanted there, that's allogeneic tissue. 
in terms of orthobiologics, we derive these tissues from either amniotic cord blood or, you know, placental tissue and so on. Um, and there's, uh, there's some talking points about that, this that I will get to. Okay, you know, so here we go. Allogeneic products, placental tissue-derived products, you can either get it from the chorionic membrane, from the amnion, um, you can get it from, you know, the, the supporting tissue that's found in the umbilical cord. Um, these are not embryonic stem cells. There was a lot of legislation about embryonic stem cells back in the Bush administration, so that's kind of off the table. We're not talking about embryos. Now, there are claims that there are viable stem cells, but by definition, based off of all this FDA stuff we were talking about, you cannot really claim that there are viable stem cells. And it's been proven time and time again because of the extensive processing that needs to be done to these tissues in order for them to have a stable shelf life, there are no viable stem cells in there, or no viable cells, really. But it is loaded with growth factors, interleukins, hyaluronic acid, all these things that make it a tremendous adjunct to, let's say, autologous therapies. Um, here's like a little, this uh, article right here, this is the FDA regulatory um, paper on on uh, using uh, human cells, tissues, and, and tissue products. And it goes through in great detail to define what is homologous use, what is minimal manipulation. Honestly, I, I'm not a big government document kind of guy, but it, it's a pleasant read. I won't lie. I read it on the airplane. Um, and here's like a little pictograph of just the amount of processing that gets done to these allogeneic tissues. So you can imagine by the time that's done, there's really not much in the way of viable cells. Okay, bone marrow aspirate and bone marrow concentrate. Um, this, basically, what you're doing is you are harvesting, you know, bone marrow tissue from flat bones, the iliac crest, the, uh, the sternum. There's some other places that are, have a little bit lower yield or less common. But basically, you harvest it by inserting a trocar or a jam sheety needle through the bony cortex. You withdraw bone marrow using a syringe. There's some techniques there so that you don't damage the tissue. Um, and then from there, you kind of isolate uh, the buffy coat, which is like this kind of white layer that is rich in these mesenchymal cells. And then from, from there, the mechanism of action of this bone marrow concentrate is not fully understood, but it's kind of like that construction site analogy I was talking about. There's a lot of cells signaling, a lot of tissue differentiation. <laughs> if I could ask you guys to mute real quick. Uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a recruitment service, basically. Here's a picture of a bone marrow aspiration. So, you know, down here you'll see this is the person here. This is called a jam sheety needle or a trocar. And then you'll see that he is aspirating all the blood cells or all the bone marrow from there. Okay. Uh, again, for the the sake of time, I'm just going to breeze over the research real quick. So there was a, a study looking at shoulder arthritis done by Centeno and others, 112 patients, 115 shoulders treated, using bone marrow concentrate for arthritis of the shoulder joint. 44% um, of the people had a – excuse me, there was a 44% reduction in their numeric pain score. They had functional improvement and pain reduction starting at one month. That's an important key. It wasn't immediate. It started at a month because you got to come over that, that first inflammatory phase. But it was sustained for up to two years. Uh, similar study done on knee arthritis. This one is interesting because they actually implemented an MRI grading protocol um, where they used this thing called ImageJ software, which looked at, like, um, you know, grayscale comparisons of, of MRI to actually demonstrate uh, improvement of the tissue. They kind of define that as like, you know, did, did that ligament, here you're, you're seeing the ACL ligament, that ligament this demonstrated more like homogeneity in its MRI signaling. And from that, they kind of extrapolated that it's healed. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of debates surrounding that. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier. You can concentrate the bone marrow and, uh, and expand them and actually grow the stem cells so that you can legitimately call it stem cell therapy. But that takes time. It's illegal in the U.S. because of that 351 clause, uh, and so that's done kind of in other countries. Um, here we are. You know, I kind of touched on this already, but the, the FDA regulations on this is, is important. It is kind of evolving 
Um, recently, allogeneic stem cells kind of got the, uh, they were under a lot of scrutiny for claiming that they had viable cells. Okay, so that's about it for bone marrow. Um, just to kind of wrap it up, uh, I, there's like a little case study over here on, on the right. This is a, a case study that was done locally in Tampa where someone had a, a non-union of a bone of a humerus fracture. This guy was young guy, super active. He was dirt biking, did a huge jump, fell <laughs> off his bike uh, and broke his arm. And a year after getting surgery, as you can see in the picture on the bottom left, the bone still did not heal. So a um, very uh, skilled doctor was able to do a bone marrow aspiration and inject that bone marrow aspirate directly on, onto the fracture site that same day. And, and at four months post-treatment, you can see on the radiographs here that he had pretty good callus formation, just like that healing cascade we were looking at earlier. Um, and that uh, I think at six months, he had a, a healed fracture. The guy reported no pain, full function. He was able to get back on his dirt bike. That is incredible. That although is, this is not a new trick. That's been done by orthopedic surgeons for years and years. And Dr. Gaddis is being humble here. He's one of the authors of this. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so is this the first a, case report in the metaverse? <laughs> it, I think so. You heard it here first. I'm going to give myself some applause. Nice. <laughs> does, does any at this point does anybody have any questions? We've been kind of going at light speed. Yeah, I mean it is 7:59 right now, so maybe we'll just open up the door. Um, if you, that's okay, James. Yeah, that's fine with me. I know we have uh, recovered. And I think I think some of the graphics are glitching a little bit anyhow. So, oh, here we go. Um, just real quick. If you guys want to do, if you guys want to see what's trending in terms of investigations of these tissues, I recommend that you go to um, clinicaltrials.gov and you just search bone marrow concentrate or search platelet-rich plasma, and you'll see all the trials that are being done right now. Um, and then my uh, my one of my dear friends and colleagues, Dr. Steinmetz, was kind of teaching me about some of the future trends in orthobiologics. Um, if I can just advance here. Oh, he doesn't want to let me. But anyways, so what are the future trends? Historically, orthobiologic research has been, hey, we've got some good stuff to inject in somebody, and let's see if it works. Well, now that we've proven that it works, let's see how we can optimize this. So now people are studying how do you correctly dose orthobiologic? How do I know what concentration of platelets to give you? How do I know what concentration of bone marrow to give you? Um, that's essentially where a lot of the studies are headed. Also, people are using artificial intelligence to develop predictive models, meaning if this person, if so-and-so comes into the clinic and has severe knee osteoarthritis, given their demographics, their comorbidities, their risk factors, all these things, uh, their MRI findings, can we predict that this person is going to respond well to this or not? Um, what else? Dr. Steinmetz, am I missing anything there with, you know, these future trends? Yeah, I think that, you know, you're hitting a lot of things that are happening as far as the future. Um, I think, as Dr. Gaddis has mentioned, this is a pretty new field, um, a good time to be getting into it, and we're kind of moving into the next phase where, now we understand it a little bit more, and we're trying to understand how the dosing works, um, and then combining that with all these very smart, talented people in AI um, to try and figure out, are, are, are people suitable for the, the treatments um, that we're trying to help them with? Agreed. Thanks, Dr. Simon. And then on the end here, we have the references. So we want to open it up to the floor. Anybody have any questions about anything? All right, if there's no questions, I want to show you guys something cool. We got this big old spine model here. So something that uh, Dr. Omar and I are working on in the future is, can we use VR to 
train physicians on procedures using 3D models much like this one. You know, can we manipulate these models and move them around in order to, uh, you know, better acquaint uh, practitioners on, on how to do procedures and things like that. Thought you guys might like that. All right. Dr. Omar, you got any uh, closing remarks? I think Dr. Omar went to sleep. Anyways, all right, well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to figure out this virtual space, come out here, spend an entire hour of your evening when you could otherwise be eating dinner with your family. Uh, so, so really, thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, if you guys have any questions, I can, mm, I will figure out a way to share my email address with all you guys. So if you have questions, please reach out to me. Um, this stage, you guys have the length of the stage. It'll be open. Feel free to come back on stage. You can thumb around with the, uh, uh, the, the, the lecture material there and play with the models and so on. So thank you, everyone, again. Um, really appreciate you coming out. Appreciate thank you, so you much, guys. Everyone. Thank you. All right. James, thank you um, all very much. Hey, James. Thank you, Dr. Gerges. Look at Pamela dancing over here. Hey. <laughs> I know. I want to do that. Let's get a selfie going. Yeah. That. With everyone. Oh, yeah. Let's get a selfie, guys. All right. I'm going to pull up a selfie camera real fast. Here's a selfie stick. Where is it? So why don't we all gather down here where I am? Can you guys see me down here, like at the bottom of the little auditorium here? Come, come down here. Let's all cluster together. Let's get behind. Let's get behind Dr. Omar. All right. Oh, perfect. Is that everyone? That's everyone that we have. All right. Three, two, one. Oh, nice. <laughs> there we are. What a beautiful bunch. All right. So yeah. All right. Well, thank Three. you so much, everyone.